Hey everybody, this is Don from Wizard Tower Games, and as you can see to my 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 left, which will be his right. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, Tom <laughs> from Tabletop Tavern is joining me tonight, and um, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking about toxicity in gaming, toxicity among game companies, and we're also going to kind of at the end jump into a little bit about AI. AI imagery, that type of thing, because we had kind of a unique situation happen today. Me and David Floor did um, when we're dealing with backer kit. So uh, RPG Grandma, hello. Thank you for listening and driving. Um, just to let you know, RPG Grandma, and oh, by the way, Thiatus, thank you for tuning in too. Both you guys are having tracking numbers tomorrow for your uh, books. I'm back from the, the living. David Floor, welcome. David, you're going to be able to get on this too, I think, because we're going to talk about Mine and yours dealing with backer kit later on today. Tom, thanks for coming on my video today too. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I mean, I think I think this might become more of a more semi regular thing from what we talked about. Yeah, I, you know, I think it was advice that uh, Eric Tenkar gave us. Yeah, Eric, <laughs> when you see this, thank you very much, sir. So, uh, yeah, me and Tom need to have a drink before we sit there and begin talking. <laughs> well, I got I got water going here. I got tea going here. Um, all right. I I wanted to oh John Scott John welcome to my channel nice to see you my friend John Scott is the lead admin creative guru rock and roll loving admin of the AD and D first edition gaming group oh thanks nice for, thanks for coming in John appreciate you being a here member of that group yes I'm a member of a bunch of them Bigfoot oh. Diaries welcome um. I want to talk a little bit about something that is, um, I think, a pervasive problem in gaming in general, in a lot of groups, um, and also among a lot of companies. And that's just plain toxicity. Um, you know, Tom is really um, a, a adept at knowing about this because me and Tom have, have a fanboy who owns a game company who's been kind of following us around and has been using several alts. Well, the fanboy also has fanboys who support yes. us, and they use alts. Jay, welcome to the channel. Hey, Jay. Gene, welcome to the channel. Yeah, good UK spirits, good Canada. energy. What's that? We're getting the whole Commonwealth. We got UK to kill. Yes. Terry R., thank you for tuning in. Welcome. Um, okay. We all know, I, I was down when it happened. Tim Cass told me about it via text, sadly. That was when Jim Ward passed away. Um, right. Jim passed away back on the, tw was it 20th or the 18th? I think it was the 20th he passed away. I have time blindness, so I don't yeah, know. It, it was it was in that area. I was down, sick yeah. as a dog when it, when it happened. So, But um, I normally don't like, calling out companies, but I think when people do really, really bad, crappy things, I think people need to talk about really bad, crappy things. So oh, you, you mean uh, there's a company out there that's uh, that would dig up Jim's corpse and uh, prop him up with their game to yeah, sell it. <laughs> absolutely. But also there, there is an online vlogger who uh, did a video short about a 30 second video short. I'm not going to call this guy out by name. Let's just put it this way. He likes to have a short series called, um, the truth about conservatives. He's attacked oh. the Warhammer community. And when they bit back, he claims victim status. But he did a video about Jim Ward. And uh, he basically um, said some pretty crappy things about Jim and his legacy. And uh, at the end of his video, he made the comment, you know, um, something to the effect of it. I'm paraphrasing about, you know, it, you know, if you're going to go ahead and mourn him, eh, whatever. You know, type thing. Oh, because he had he had been connected to Giant Lands, which was connected to New GSR, which and is so, connected to Stephen Dinehart and that type of thing. So now that the guy's dead, we're taking a, a cheap which, shots because it's easy. A dump on his grave. Yeah, because you can't because Jim Ward can't defend himself. And I yeah. found out about the video because Tim Cass told me about the video. Uh, and um, and so I watched the video, and um, you know. To, he has a channel supposedly devoted to gaming, but he hardly ever posts any gaming content. He's always just basically making fun of people, mocking people. And then when people call him out on it, he mocks them more. And then when they get mad, he's like, oh, I'm a victim type thing. 
Um, well, he'll also run away if like 40 of us were like beating at his door. Yeah, he would, he yeah. would run away and hide and maybe put up a suicide is painless video. Yeah, he's the one that made the um, he's the guy who basically um, called Victor Dorso a Nazi and then went behind Victor's back and tried to get Dave Con canceled. Yeah. And when Victor, to Victor's credit, didn't put up this BS. You're right. He did that video where he alluded he was going to kill himself. And, you know, 3000 of his followers, he blasted that to him. They went dark. You know, um, well, that's because he doesn't have 3000 followers. I thought he did. Well, it might say 3000 subs, but I'm, I'm fully convinced that with the number of views he gets that those were uh, Chinese sub farm. Oh, OK. I got it. Yeah, because he usually gets about what between two and five views per video or something like that. Yeah, he gets very low views, so he doesn't have 3000 followers. Gotcha. RPG Grandma says, yeah, I had to explain to Emperor's Choice folks who the fanboy was after he went after me. They were angry, not to mention the self-defense folks and law enforcement officers saw who know me. Yeah, yeah people like to take cheap shots of people online. Um, I invited him on my show. I did, and he won't come on my show for some reason. Don't ask me why. Yeah. Um, hey, Thraxis, how you doing? Um, yeah, Jim. Jim, the thing is, is this about Jim, and I, and I wanted to address this because I think it's unfair to Jim Ward for people to to do that to him is – you know, I, I've had a couple phone conversations with Jim Ward, and I also had um, email and PM conversations. And, you know, Jim was always, J Jim was never political, and Jim was always willing to help you out, always willing to answer questions. Um, Tim Cask made a really good point about him, and that is every single game convention that Jim Ward went to, every one of his games were signed out in full, way ahead of time and had long waiting lists. And, um, you know, he was the type of guy that, you know, you could stop him in the con and he would take a picture with you. He would sit there and shake your hand, you know, sign your stuff. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't one of these guys who thought he was better than everybody else. Yeah. And, you know, I think that, um, you know, you know, there, there's a whole aspect of, you know, the guy was 72, I think. Mm-hmm. He had extreme health problems and yeah, maybe, maybe once or twice he wasn't in the mood to sit there and talk. I mean, I believe the man lost a foot due to diabetes and such, you know, and you know, it's like me, you know, if you would have talked to me on the phone a week ago, I don't think you would have got the, hi, how you doing, Tom? You probably would have got the, you know, want to hang up the phone, you know, no, we in the, the, uh, Son's in the hospital right now. This is his wife. Uh, you know, he'll be back in a few days. Okay. Yeah. We, you know, we just kind of shrug it off as, all right, don't yeah. start seeing his doctors. and Situation normal. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, no, we don't want that to be situation normal. Oh, I know. I get it. You know, the thing is, is it just, it's like what um, RPG Grandma says, you know, what, what it is, there, there's a few select people that are going after Jim online. And every one of these people going after Jim online, none of them, I bet you, have ever talked to the man. None of them have ever gave the target. Man. Yeah, he's easy. You know, and it's bully mentality. They look yeah. for an easy target. He's dead now. And honestly, the uh, you know, my father always said this, and I think there's just certain things in life that we we need to hang on to, we need to keep, and it's like never speak ill of the dead. All right, the guy's dead. He can't defend himself. Let it be. All right, Adolf Hitler, we could talk crap about him. <clears throat> okay? He was an asshole, if I can say that on your channel. Um, you know. Oh, wait a minute. I got confused when you mentioned Hitler. You're talking about the one from 1943, not the yeah. one that's alive today. But, you know, look, um, Jim's dead. And uh, honestly, we don't know for sure what his attitude was towards supporting Dinehart. I think he was just trying to be helpful. Yeah, Dinehart contracted with him to I write. I can tell you what it is. Yeah. You know, I, I can tell you because, you know, sadly, I mean, I have to I have to admit this on I've done it before, but he knows. You know, my association with my association with TSR back in the day, back in, you know, midsummer to December 2021. You know, let's face it. I was deep in bed with him. I was guzzling the Kool-Aid. I thought that you and Eric Tenkar were, were the absolute most evil, you know, lying people in the world because I believed Lanasa at his point of his word. And, um, I mean, you laugh about it, but it's true, you know? 
And the thing is, I know what happened with the whole thing. And I'm just going to say it out here for everybody to hear because, because I was privy to it. What happened very simply was this. And that is, originally, Dinehart and Lanasa were going to work with, or excuse me, Dinehart and Ward were developing giant lands pre Lanasa. Right. Dinehart and Lanasa started up, you know, helped start up TSR along with Ernie Gygax and Jeff Leeson. And they all kind of got together. And then, you know, you got Dinehart's personality and Lanasa's personality, which are, which both, oh yeah, boom, big time. And, you know, they both think they know everything about gaming and they both don't want to listen to advice and they clashed. And Dinehart basically took his ball and went home. And because him and Ward were working together, just like Ernie and Justin were working together, they split. And barring all of the URL stuff and all of that, um, you know, Lanasa and Hovermail pointed the finger at Dinehart over the racist bigoted tweets, which I don't believe for a minute because they continued even after Dinehart left and they had back control yep. of the social media accounts. Yep. But the point being is, is I've talked to, I talked to Ward many times via PM um, twice on the phone, several times via PM. And, you know, the man, you know, right off the bat in early on, I asked him about it and he said, listen, Don, I don't care about none of that. I'm developing a game with Steven all I want to do is make games, enjoy my life, enjoy my fans, enjoy gaming. And that's what he did. He wanted to make games. Yeah. So to me, that sounds like a pure motive. And to speak ill of him when he can't defend himself Absolutely. is just lowbrow. And it's just, uh, you know, go back to the trailer park and, uh, you know, go back to the ghetto, wherever you came from. Yep. And, uh, you know, it's just there's enough. In my mind, there's enough doubt. You know, there's a, there's enough. Uh, what is it? The uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt um, when you in, in jury trials. Oh, um, preponderance of the evidence. No, it, beyond a shadow. Doubt, there's a there's a beyond a shadow of a doubt. Beyond, uh, you know, that. Look, we don't. You know, unless he came, unless Jim Ward wrote a diary and said, "I love Nazis and I'm yeah. white," and he wrote all that. Then, then leave, leave leave the guy alone. You yeah, don't yeah. know, yeah. okay? You don't live in that man's head. And and the, the biggest thing that that irritates me in politics, in religion, in <clears throat> social media, is when somebody tells me what I'm thinking in my head. Mm -hmm. I'm the expert. I'll tell you mm -hmm. what I'm thinking. I'm the yeah. expert on what's in my head, not you. Um, now you can look at something I wrote, something I said, and extrapolate from that. But mm -hmm. you know, so many times I've been told, obviously you're this, and I'm like, eh, well, the thing is, Thraxus makes a good point here. He said, got to meet Jim Ward at North Texas RPG Con several years ago. He held the whole room captive with a smile, wit, and super nice guy. You know what? Thraxus is not the only guy who has told me that. I when 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 I. I was down on my back. So staring at my phone was a thing for several days, 24 seven. Right. And I'll tell you what, when that man passed, that's all I saw people say about him was great guy, you know, joking around about, you know, he was, he was known as the TPK guy, you know what I mean? And, and such. And it just, like I said, it just really upset me when I was talking to Tim on the phone and Tim was pretty ticked off about it. And he told me about that video and I went to it and I watched it. And, um, you know, my, my thing is, is, you know, it would be, it would be one thing to sit there and, you know, talk about a legacy of a person, but get the legacy right. Because I'll bet you 50 bucks, hard cash money that Dave, and I'm not going to mention his last name, but Dave never talked to Jim Ward. You know, he's just going off of what he's heard because um, that's pretty much what his channel is. Uh, well, I bet you he couldn't even list five things that Dave wrote. I oh, mean, the, I bet you he couldn't. I, yeah. I guarantee he could. I, I yeah. to be it, and then, then after that, yeah. uh, you know. But um, David Floor says, "Hey, I could have been evil too." Oh, we, you were, you were, David. Trust me, you, you were thought to be evil. <laughs> we all have that capacity to to uh, 
to, to, to sin. And, you know, even the Bible says things like be angry and sin not, you know, but, but so the, you, you, yeah. you, can be, you know, you can be angry, you can express that anger, but there's a point where you cross the line, you know, with that and you give too much vent to that anger. And then, and then it's like, Oh, now I got to go apologize to somebody, you know? So, well, the thing is with me is, you know, moving on from Jim, you know, Jim Ward in my book, and I'm just going to say it in my opinion is I thought, I think, I think Jim Ward was a hell of a nice guy. I, he was a hell of a gifted game designer and he, and, and I wish I had one twenty fifth of his skill at DMing. I mean, mm. he was an expert expert dm i mean to this to the word so you know god rest his soul hope yeah. he's gaming up with gary and i hope his family you know it wishes you know offer his family condolences over it too because he was a great 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 game designer great great guy all around i think amen i agree but the thing is is what really bugs me here about gaming in general and the toxicity in the gaming community you know um i see it every single day you know people use the term woke and they in and, and you know, people get mad at somebody because, you know, they like fifth edition, you know, they have the sin of liking fifth or liking first. <laughs> and there's this, there's this weird battle happening right now in gaming, I notice. And that is what you have is you have people who predominantly play um, older editions of D&D. Then you have the 5e lovers and you have a core element, not everybody, of course, but you have a core element in the 5e lovers that think all the guys who play the older editions are a bunch of racist, white, cis males, as they call them. And then you've got people in the older editions. It's just a small core group of people, just like the other one, who think that all the fifth edition people, you know, are, you know, they use terms like woke and stuff. And I always throw this out there at people. And, and this is just me proffering my opinion. Disagree, if you, comments, please. I'd, lo I'd love to hear it. Is this. I personally like Advanced Dungeon and Dragons. I also like Beck Me. I know for a fact you and I disagree about Beck Me. Because you like... BX. That's right. So the thing is, is, but do you notice something? We're friends and we're on the show together talking right now. Well, why? Yeah. Because you don't got to like what I like to play. You know what's important? You're playing D&D. &D. There's where the key of it is. Well, I, I have two comments to that. I, uh, sure. Uh, my plumbing partner that I worked with for a couple of years, was he was Sicilian. And I was, uh, you know, there are a lot of news rep reports were coming out about, like, drink the red wine for your heart and all that. So I, was, I had not been drinking wine. I, you know, just... So I was trying to ask him when we're, we're sitting at lunch one time and I'm trying to ask him about uh, that red wine with red meat, white. And he's like, ah, drink what the hell you like. Agreed. <laughs> and I found that that phrase actually fits for a lot of things. So mm -hmm. like if, if, uh, if play what the hell you like, you know, or, you know, vote what the hell you like. I mean, you know, it's it just you do you. And I, I, I just found that that phrase really just works. It was so much wisdom in that phrase. I think it works in a lot of things in life. But well, I, 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 okay, go ahead. No, I was just saying. I think John Scott will tell you about me and his group because I used to be an admin in the in the AD and D group, and uh, I, I, I do it even to this day. Is I tell people when they're going back and forth like this, I'm like, wait, stop. What does it matter? You're playing D and D. Right. You know, you may you may you may think fifth edition sucks or someone playing fifth may think A, D and D sucks is horrible. But the bottom line is. If you're at a table with a group of friends, you're rolling dice, having a good time. It doesn't matter the edition because, you know, even though Wizards of the Coast is doing all these changes to D and D and they're doing all these modifications and such, there's one thing that holds true. Even though I may not like those additions and modifications, I've got my orange spines, man. I can break them out. I got my Beckme boxes. I can break them out. Hell, I've got. You know, when you look at the way I play AD and D to begin with, sure. My version of Advanced Dungeon and Dragons One E is is very different. Yeah, there you go. Is very different than the uh, than the book version, you know. And Kevin King, Kevin, thank you for tuning in the channel. He says culture war is becoming inescapable bodes ill for a society. I agree. I think it really bodes ill because so many people latch onto it. I, 
I've been thinking about this. Uh, I'm glad he brought up the culture war. Um, you, you know, when you go online and uh, you see uh, some old schoolers poking fun at uh, the, the young kids playing 5e, you know, and, you know, and, and you see that back. I think there's a natural impulse in people to, um, to do that sort of thing. And I, and I was thinking of a incident in high school. Uh, I was a short, skinny, scrawny kid. And so I, I got hazed my, my freshman year and uh, I then played football my sophomore year and then the hazing stopped. But I remember this one kid that I, I hung out with, uh, his name was Jim, beat up one of the nerds. And he ended up in the guidance counselor's office. And so after that, I was thinking like, yeah, I'm going to talk crap about that nerd, even though I was a nerd secretly away from school playing D&D. &D. Um, and, you know, Jim, Jim pulled me up short. He was like, he's like, why? Why are you picking on him? You, you know, and, and, you know, cause he had a heart to heart and I think there's just this natural to those people are different. And I just gonna, you know, and, and you get that in religion, you get that in gaming, um, you know, you, you get that in the military. My dad was air force Oh yeah, and, and you know, and it's always, what, you know, what is it they say about air force chair force <laughs> or well, I mean, it, it's, it's like, it's like in the, in the army, you know what I mean? You know, yeah. You always talk. You always talk about you know boots, you know in the mill in in the army, and but you make a good point. And and John says here, fun, friends, and imagination. That's a constant in all incarnations of the game. If the kids are having fun with five E, then more power to them. But kind of bringing in what you just talked about, Tom. You're right. It you know this whole thing with you know, it's sort of like the Pepsi challenge. Even you know some people like Pepsi, some people like Coke. And I'm going to pick on my wife. Okay, she's in the next room, probably listening to me, but, but yeah, I know. <laughs> but my wife loves Coke, Coca Cola, but my wife doesn't like Pepsi, you know. And actually, we've actually, my wife will actually call a restaurant up and go, "Do you serve Coke?" And if they serve Pepsi, most likely we're not going to that restaurant. <laughs> now I'm gonna catch a bunch of shit from my wife after I got this video, probably. But you know, that's the way life goes, you know. <laughs> But no, I mean, but but that's what you get. You get people everything from gaming to even people who go, oh my God, you put pineapple on pizza, you just destroyed it, type thing. Yeah, so many people, no, man, you like it, so eat it. Dump on that, and I'm like, then don't eat it. You know, don't eat it. You don't like yeah. pizza. you don't want like to eat pizza. Don't eat it. And and that's the thing that 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 this is this really leads right into my issue with some game companies. Now, I don't, you know, I'm I'm a game company and. I think that it's the responsibility of game companies to speak up, even if it's about another game company. And I'm not going to mention names. I guess if the shoe fits and you're watching this video, then wear it. But, you know, you get game companies that that play into this. They play into these culture wars. You know, um, there's a Twitter account and a Facebook account that that really, really, I mean, very talented game designer the guy is. You know, very, I think he's going to be on Eric Tenkar's show, as a matter of fact. But when you look at his when you look at his Twitter account, it's very toxic. You know, he really despises liberals and Democrats and such. And I think that, and this is something people notice about my game, my my gaming social media. I stay away from politics. Yeah. Because I think I learned when I had my publishing business. One of the biggest, most common questions I had with authors who had come in to want to publish with me, they'd say, "Who'd you vote for last election?" doesn't matter. I, I'm not, you're not hiring me because I voted Republican or Democrat. You're hiring me because you want publishing services. None of your business because yeah. the voting booth is private. Yes. That's one of the things. And, and see, that's kind of what I do. Cause you're, you're a friend of me, mine on Facebook right. and you see my Facebook friends list. I have friends from all over the world, but also I have people who are gay and trans. I have people that are staunch conservatives. I have people that are Blaming liberals, you know, and it's and the reason why I do that is because I don't care about your politics and your social stances. Just don't be an asshole to me and yeah. don't be an asshole to my friends, you know, because I think that we all can get along because I kind of carry my Facebook page like I do my D&D &D table. Let's all kind of conjoin, man. I'll tell you what, 
I'll make the chili. I'll supply the iced tea and beer. You bring the dice and your books and let's all have some fun. Yeah. Um, so, you know, by the way, we have 23 people watching the video. Thank you very much, everybody, for tuning in tonight. Um, I would love, and I think Tom would agree with me, Tom. Yeah. Say so if you do, is I'd love to hear from everybody. What is your favorite what is your favorite edition of D&D and why? I'd really like to hear that from people. Um, you know, uh, Thraxis says, I think when it comes from the generational differences between the groups, but it's not unbridgeable. I run a group of kids in their early 20s. Thraxis, very good point. And I'll bring up my friend and um, partner, Tim Kask. Tim Kask, um, you know, is a 70... I'm sorry I'm butchering this 72, 73 year old man. And the guy hosts younger players from Japan, I believe once a week, I think he does, or once a month. He volunteers at local schools, helping schools out and doing, he's talking about getting D and D groups going with high schoolers and such. Um, you know, I think that that's the great thing about D and D. And I think that's part of what made D and D so popular so quick and the reason why we're on year 50th of it is because D and D was one of those unique games where, man, you know, not only did it not matter if it was, you know, what your social status was, you know, who it was, but you could change the game as you wanted it to be, you know, it, you know, you had vanilla, but you could add to it as you wanted. It was, it was ultimately customizable. And the earlier editions were, were very, um, you know, uh, rulings, not rules. Whereas yeah. the pendulum has swung, you mm -hmm. know, to the far extreme of rules, not rulings, you know, and I think based off of what I believe about pendulum theory is, is the pendulum was way over here with the, with the, you know, rulings, not rules, and it's gone to the far extreme. I think it's only a matter of time that it's going to come back in the other direction. I think you're, and I think you're, you're seeing a lot of that with things like shadow dark. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a lot of the three, you know, the independent publishing going on, you know, particularly through drive through. Well, well, there's a hell of a lot of talented game designers out there. Yeah. Putting out some really good product, you know, and they're not the, they're not part of the big three or four, like troll Lord and Watsy and such. Nothing wrong with Troll Lord. I'm not. I'm not knocking. But I'm saying is these are guys like, you know, that are that that work out of their their house out of a bedroom, and they're putting out some damn fine RPGs. Um, Thraxis says I have a dice older than them, but I got them when I worked at their college, and we're all roommates. Now we play online. I move them over from Shadow Dark. They love it and love the game. You know, again, right. online. You know, times yeah. change. You know, what I mean, you know. You know, bat, you know, and we're, we're the same age. We're both 56. You know, when we were kids, like when we were 15, the Internet wasn't a thing, yeah. you know. And so if you wanted to play D&D, &D, if you want to know if your friend could play D&D, &D, if he didn't answer the phone, you had to pedal your bike across two, three blocks to your buddy's house and knock on his front door. You know, now people can get online. They can do and all that. Yeah. Paul, welcome to the channel tonight. Thank you for tuning hey, in. Paul. I really appreciate it. So John Scott says the one that I'm working on now. Okay, John, go ahead and be evasive. We're going to talk about this. I want to know what you're working on. Cause I think I know it, it for people who don't know, John Scott is a prolific game designer and he puts out some really interesting. So I'll, I'll drop you a link to the group. Uh, Tom, John is really cool. He puts out a lot of stuff. Um, the Bigfoot dice is 3.5 skills, skills, skills. <laughs> I like skills. I know a lot of people don't. What's your opinion of skills? I hated 3.5. I, I, I had been away from D&D for a while and I found a group and I was like, Hey, I used to play D&D. Can I sit in? And uh, they said, sure. And I really gave it the college try. I ran two character, one character up to 20 and we started over. Oh, what? I, Wait, the sorry. dog's over here banging his bone on the floor. It is. It's the so, peanut butter bone. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I ran a, a monk up to level 18. And I just, after after those two campaigns, I just was like, 
stick a fork in me. I'm done with 3.5. I do not you see, like um, the RPG we're putting out. Was a tower? Um, I gotta take that phone from the dog. Oh, you're fine. Go ahead. Um, is going to be heavily skill based. We it's it's heavily heavily skill driven. Um, just a fan. It'll still be good, John. I've seen the stuff that you do. You're a great game designer. Um, Gunther the Mad, welcome to the channel. Thank you for tuning in. He says, I am a BX fan. Sure, it's simple. doesn't have all the bells and whistles other editions have, but I prefer it that way. And see, yeah. that's the thing that I like about um, Beck Me is I just like some. I just like the simplicity of it. And whenever I play Beck Me, I normally don't get outside the red box area of it. Right. I really don't because I'm not a power gamer. You know, to be totally candid with you, I'm right. My my sweet spot in gaming is between third level and seventh level. If I if I could have between third and seventh, and then just simply arbitrarily go attack an eye of the beholder and, and kill myself and start over, I'm happy. I, I don't like I don't like ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth level characters. I really don't. Even magic users, I don't like them. I don't. I think what the, what was the uh, I think Eric reported on the survey. They found that you know most campaigns don't get past seventh, ninth level. Yeah. Well, I mean, in all the gaming that I've done in the last, um, well, I've been playing since 77. So in the last 46 years of gaming, God, I'm freaking old, 46 years gaming. <laughs> but, you know, in, in, in the 46 I've been doing it, I think the highest level PC I ever ran, I think was like maybe 11th level, you know, and then it just gets to the point where it's so easy, you know, you, it, unless they're throwing crazy, crazy stuff at you, you know, it just is like, meh, you know, yeah. well, there's 25 goblins. Okay. I'll whip out my sword of whatever and I'll decimate them. And, you know, it's like, nah, um, Rick Anderson, thank you for tuning into the channel. Rick says, um, favorite D and D my household house ruled one E amen, brother. To me, that's the point. Learn the rules, master them, then do it your way. After that, become it becomes create the game you want to play. Working on two different RPGs myself. You know, I agree. I mean, that's what Open Worlds was. Open Worlds was basically, you know, my amalgamated, mixed up, chooken up, dumped out, remixed, you know, RPG. And it's just, it. it's what I prefer to play. You know, um, do you have Tom? What, what do you just kind of throw some edge? I don't mean to throw a bell curve at you, but you know, when it comes to the way that you game, do you have? I mean, how 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 much are you homebrewed? How much is the Veralt household in gaming? You know? <laughs> well, mostly, um, mostly it's this, um, this mm. old Ori chestnut, and um, yeah. Everything's homebrewed to a certain extent. Like um, for a long time, I was using a fan skill system called uh, a skilled front. I want to show you something. Go ahead. And um, so I really, really liked it. It was very customizable. But it was a little. It was it was finicky in that it really took some explaining to a new player. And so then I I, I you know I just you know what I've I've gone back to this um, you know with the three PSAs. And I just, it's easy to use. I might modify this and do a, a scout PSA where you've got like veterinary and a lot of the, you know, the woodcraft, bushcraft skills that are in the uh, environmental skill and just call environmental science. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, mostly, but to a certain degree, you're, you're going to homebrew, you're going to modify because, you know, we, we're doing a lot of online. So a lot of the, very tactical combat rules we ignore for the sake of doing uh, online gaming. You know, you just, you know, five bands of uh, what you got. My homebrew. <laughs> I so, mean, so, so your stuff is skill based also. You, you keep the skill kind of thing going. Well, I like star frontiers and um, most Never of would have known that. Most of my homebrew really is 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 uh, tied to the magazine and writing <laughs> so much, and so that I know the system, I know the the canon setting fairly well, and I know a lot of what's out there that other fans have written that I was like, oh, that mm -hmm. was really cool. Like, 
you know, um, you know, Richard Rose, Shadow Shack did this great article way back in the early Star Frontiersmen on Yazarian clans. And I was like, that's great material. I love it. That's 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 mine now. That's that's part of my mm -hmm. my world, my campaign. Um, so you know, most of my homebrew is really about pulling all of what I know is out there for, for setting together and using that and, and honoring fan canon that I think is really fantastic yeah. and bringing it right in and, and building off of it. And How so, do you stay organized, though? What, what, are, what are your tools to stay organized? I, mean, um, I have a three ring binder, but I also made a wiki. For my for my world and such. Yeah, probably I probably could use a good wiki, but um, I have a spreadsheet of all the articles ever written for Star Frontiers, <clears throat> and so if I got to go look something up, I'm like, all right, right, yeah, where was that? So I'll go look it up, find the magazine, then I go to the magazine because there's, you know, thirty, there's twenty five original Star Frontiersmen. Um, I've now helped publish four more of Star mm -hmm. Frontiersman Volume 2, there was the uh, 36 Frontier Explorer that I worked on with Tom Stevens. So there's a lot of fan content out there. And I just, uh, you know, I when I drove um, catering back in Boston, I, I just always, the brain was always going on that. And, and so I kind of lived through all of that stuff being written and was there with the fans when, fans came out with really great content and I was like, Oh, this is going to be in the magazine. Hey, yeah. you did a great post. We got to get this in the magazine. And, and, you know, cause I was like a content editor back in those days. And mm -hmm. so I kind of lived it. So I have an idea of what's out there and, you know, sometimes I forget what I <laughs> wrote and then I'll start writing a, a new article and I'll be, Oh, I already wrote this, <laughs> mm -hmm. but it's, it's, there's a well, lot, there's a yeah. lot up here. That, that's what helped me with the wiki because I was doing the same thing was I would I would log something out or mark something down and then I'd get a brilliant idea a couple months later, but it would be the same thing I did. So yeah. what I found was a buddy of mine, Steve, um, did a thing. He has a thing called Media Wiki. It's kind of like a public wiki that you can download and make your own wiki. Mm -hmm. So he had it for his he He writes sci fi and uh he found that his keeping track of his world and his writing within that helped him. And because I write fantasy, um, right. I thought I'll, I'll make my own wiki and mix the two. Cause my game is based on my world setting, which is where all my fantasy writing comes from. So um, it really helps you keep track of such. Well, actually I have a new tool I'm playing with. Uh, in my new job, I was uh, talking to one of the other teachers and she, and she mentioned um, because you know we, we've there's been a lot of AI bashing in the yeah, game. Yeah, and actually for everybody, we're going to get into AI talking about. In fact, maybe this is going to be a segue into it. Yeah. Well, so I, I'm sitting there in this meeting with the, all with these other teachers, and you know I'm I'm just a new guy, and I'm just kind of staying quiet and trying not to show how stupid I am by opening my mouth. And I hear this comment about writing the curriculum with AI and I'm thinking I've seen AI writing <laughs> mm -hmm. and I'm thinking these kids are going to be screwed up. So I start asking questions and um, what I didn't realize is, is that a lot of people go to chat GTP or GPT and um, they play with 3.5 because you don't have to pay for that. And they go, Oh, this is crap. Or you get people produce something with it. Because, well, you know, I'll just use this because it's free. And they, what they produce is crap. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, so I started um, talking with her. And she was, with, with the 4.0 subscription, you get these chat bots that you get to train. And so she had just been training this one chat bot on the science curriculum for seventh graders. And for two years, she's been working with this thing and now got it to the place where it's not student facing, but it's it's teacher facing. And they're using it to write the curriculum for the for the school system. And it's like, wow, was, that just blows my mind. I was mind blown because I'm looking at that going, I want a chat bot. I can train for Star now, Frontiers. Hold on. Don't mean to interrupt, but is this is this Maine? Where you, this is you the Maine. Maine. OK, because see, in Michigan. Um, curriculum is very rigidly controlled. 
you know, by the state. I mean, the, the guidelines are very, I mean, I, my wife could too, you know, she's, my wife could talk better about this than I, but I, from what I understand in Michigan, um, the curriculum is kind of like your pathway that you got to follow. You can veer off it a little bit, yeah, but not much. Well, I'll just, I'll just mention this, that, um, may, um, yeah, Maine's different. We live next door to New Hampshire, and their their motto is "Live free or die." Yeah. And while they might live free or die, Maine, Maine's got the highest uh, Second Amendment ownership uh, per capita of the nation. Mm-hmm. So it's just it's just different here, and and it you know it's a school district in the country, so everything's just relaxed. And I was yeah. like. Uh, you know, I'm not punching a time clock. I just sign in. It's it's just very relaxed rules, and I'm I'm kind of like, well, this is kind of cool. I kind of like this. Nobody's uptight. Nobody wears a tie. It's great. But um, so yeah, they're using, but it, they're only because of her because she's become an expert on it and she's worked with this chat bot for uh, two years. So years. it's kind of like a uh, almost yeah. like a like a test case, if you will, maybe. Yes. And okay. because the and now one of the other science teachers came to me and said, listen, I have a project for you uh, because the AI can actually take, uh, you know, we have a kid, you know, seventh grader. He's not reading at seventh grade level. You know, he's his reading level is a little bit lower. They want me to take some of that curriculum or the textbooks and feed it through AI and have AI, you know, take the uh, reading level down. Yeah. And which it can do that apparently. I've so I've been that's part of why I've been playing around because I was like, oh, these this AI is not what I first thought when it hit the community. But see, that type of AI can be beneficial. Yeah. But there's another side of AI. And me and David Floor ran into this in spades today, and that is yeah. AI and the paranoia around it. And I want to clarify my point real quick. Um you know, the, the, using the term paranoia, the paranoia around it, um, you know, can really screw with you because, um, I, you know, me and David are working together. I'm helping David with Atomic Age's RPG. He's helping me with Zonk, you know, kind of like a good, you know, symbiont relationship. You know, he's helping me. I'm helping him. Well, um, I made a graphic inside, um, which is for his cover, Atomic Age. Right. And. Dave is getting it hooked up for um, backer kit and backer kit came back and booted it back and said, no, we suspect AI. And what was frustrating about it is, is not the fact to me that they booted it. The thing that was frustrating to me was, was that backer kit did not have a, a streamlined or even a semi streamlined way of going, Oh no, we, we, this isn't, this isn't AI here. You know, and I, I think that, and I've seen this online, you know, we all know about the big lawsuit, the class action against Mid Journey, you know, the uh, inside guy outed Mid Journey. We know that they use, um, they, we know that they use um, IP because, you know, as an example, um, when I had the problem, I called Jim Wampler and um, I was like, hey, Jim, I kind of explained the situation with him. And Jim's like, where are you getting your art from? And I said, well, I get my base imagery from a, from Adobe. And he's like, ah, try this. And for everybody who wants to try something interesting, go to Adobe and then go to stock photo and do the same prompt. And the prompt you want to do is go, go wizard sitting in front of a computer. And it's amazing because when you do that at Adobe, it shows Gandalf sitting in front of a computer. Now, why would it be Gandalf? Do you, do you know what I mean? But when you go to stock photo, who, who, although they, now that we dug into it, they do use AI, but they clearly label it as yes. um, AI assisted. So, you know, and you can also exclude AI, but you know, I, I know that AI is very popular with people because especially a lot of small publishers, because it's free. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. The problem that I have with AI, though, is, is that, you know, for those who use it and you're a publisher, um, I think that I think that that's a mistake. And the reason why it's a mistake is because 
I believe there's a couple different sides of the coin here to look at is number one, you know, if you're going to use um, AI imagery, even if AI image, let's say perfect world, they fixed AI, it does not use any type of IP that's not approved. So it's, it's for back of a better word, it's clean. Okay. When I first started out as a pub, game publisher, I had three well-known artists say, you know what? You can use my artwork. Some gave it to me dirt cheap and some actually just said, you can use it. Just put my name on it. They helped me. Right. AI, although great for the guy who's like a home user, you want your players to roll up some characters and have some cool looking PCs. That's great. But for a game publishing business, I, I just personally, this is just my Don at Wizard Tower Games opinion here. I just think that, especially if you've dealt with other artists before, you're kind of cutting those artists short, you know? Well, I've taken a stand against AI art as the publisher of the Star Frontiersman. Yes, you did. And so we, we don't allow it. A uh, couple pieces in the early days slipped in. We're calling a mulligan on those. No more from this point on until there is uh, either court precedents that protect artists or until there's legislation, you know, if Congress ever gets off their butt and actually does something um, <laughs> to regulate, you know, because what is happening and I, you know, look, I know people are going to disagree with me on this. I've, I've heard the arguments, but the fact that um, for AI music, they're very carefully excluding anything copyright from the, training data just tells me that they're worried about being sued. They're worried about copyright there mm -hmm. but with artists, but with AI art, they're just, they're just scraping the internet and sweeping up everybody's art and putting it in there. And it is not fair. The artist should be able to benefit from his work and he should be able to opt out of having his stuff in there. So, you know, to me, it's a copyright issue. It's about protecting artists. It's about protecting, um, you know, people who work hard. Um, they, sh they should be able to get paid for what they're doing. As art, you know, but they they go ahead and they do this. They scrape up the whole internet because they're starving artists. They figure they won't get a sued, but yet Getty Images had deeper pockets and did bring a lawsuit. Um, I think you mentioned the other <laughs> lawsuit there. There are some out there. So, until it settles, I'm not participating in AI art, but clearly I'm looking at chatbots as a different tool uh, because I'm looking to, I'm what I'm looking to do is I'm looking to train this chatbot so that I could have it roll up a Star Frontiers character. But you know, but, you know, but the thing or is, or or do a Star Frontiers robot and spit it but out. But see, there's a difference there about yeah. AI because this, the, my, my thinking is this is if you use chat GPT, okay. And you say, give me a short story about red dragons. Okay. And it talks about red dragons as long as it's not, and you can confirm that it's not copying like maybe David Eddings or Conan or, or, or Tolkien or whatever. That's fairly easy to do. The problem with the visual side of it, is that if you say, you know, give me a red dragon, chances are, and I did this actually, I did this actually earlier today in research for this, for this video, I went ahead and I was like, you know what? I'm curious about something. Draw me a red dragon in the style of Larry Elmore from Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. The first image it pulled up looked really close to the iconic red dragon. <laughs> on back me and the thing is that tells you right there that you know because there's a difference between saying the red dragon flew out of the cave and blew you know fire and its name was smog you can go oh smog is tolkien and you can remove it okay and call it sparky if you want but the problem with imagery is is it's obvious it's pulling from people who use it and do artwork for a living and i'm talking about on a game publishing 
standpoint, as a publisher of games, you know, people like Dean Spencer and Eric Lofgren helped me out with, with artwork and I bought their artwork and used it and such trying to support them. If I'm just going to go ahead and say, guys, thanks for the memories. <laughs> Screw you. I can get it free now. No, I prefer to support it. And you know what? If I got to pay, I'm sorry. And these are the rates that these guys charge. And yeah, it's open. They, they sell to a lot of people, but you know, if I got to pay Eric Lofgren 25 bucks for a piece of his art or Dean Spencer, 25 bucks, that's a bargain for me. That's actually pretty good because, uh, oh, yeah, I've seen rates much, much higher. Than that. Yeah. Thraxis says, funny enough, I don't really have a favorite edition of D&D. I love the Hackmaster licensed version. Oh, that's a that that's a game I haven't played in a long time. Um, by Kenzer Company in the early 2000s. After that, 1E and 2E. David Floor says, you still get generated AI content even if you choose to exclude AI. Good point, David. He's right. And see, that's another thing that to me is scurvy. If you're going to go to a stock photo place and you're going to trust them and say, exclude AI art and they keep plugging it in. I'm not a conspiracy kind of guy, but that stinks of something going on knowingly. Like they're almost like they're trying to get that stuff. So permeated in the fabric of our, of our, of society. Well, it becomes so complicated in depth. They can't police it. What, what I've done um, is because my, my method of art uh, I'm not very good at at, uh, at Photoshop, which is why I, I kick it to you. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm like, hey, could you do some Photoshop? And because you're so fast at it. And I, you know, me, it's it's like four hours to do one little, to do one mm-hmm. thing. And but, so I draw. I work in graphite. I work in charcoal. I like to free draw. And so one of the things I've done is I've taken some of that stock photo art and I've been like, oh, I think this is AI, but I've used it as a drawing reference where, you know, AI art would be very useful. Yeah. Uh, That's great for AI art. Absolutely. And, and one of the, like I've taken, um, trying to, uh, we're working on a, um, we're, uh, Jason Messier, um, you know, Bigfoot Diaries and I are, mm-hmm. uh, working on compiling a monster manual for star frontiers. That's all of the fan mm-hmm. creations. And I mean, Oh, hell yeah. Well, I mean, I've scaled it down to a, a limited amount because otherwise it's like 400 listings going into that thing. We're talking oh, crazy. Come on. Live dangerously, man. Come on. <laughs> Ride the razor. Um, but you know, in some of these creatures or some of these fan creations, I've actually gone to AI and said, all right, I need a, a bird, alligator, snake creature, you know, just to see what it kicks out. And, uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you, and you, you know, you, you throw away the chaff and you find one. Oh, I kind of like this. Yeah. And I start drawing from that because I couldn't conceptualize what this other fan had come up with. And so I used the AI to conceptualize it. I'm like, oh, okay. I, yeah. All right. I can do that. So I've, I've done that just because I just could not think of anything. And so I used the AI to spark my own imagination. Yeah. Cause it's, it's the same thing as years ago when I first was like, okay, I, you know, I know how to lay out books, but a game does, you know, a game manual is a unique creature. It's a, it's a unique thing in itself. Cause it's, you know, the way it's presented, I looked at my D and D books and I looked at, um, I looked at my D and D books and I also looked at, um, Oh, I forget the game system. Oh, GURPS. And I looked at how they laid their manuals out. Mm. So it's the same thing. You're using AI art to go ahead and get inspiration as to, because I'm a visual person. You can, you can tell me something 10 times, but if you show it to me once, I'll learn it quicker looking at it than I will. If you tell me 10 times. Yeah. Um, worldwide Goji Kai. Uh, thank you for tuning into the channel. Uh, he says, favorite D&D is BX, Beck Me, and 1EA D&D. Man, if you're living local, man, let's do some gaming. <clears throat> I have his address somewhere. I mailed him a, I think I mailed him a coffee cup one time. Gotcha. Oh, Tom, notate this. RPG Grandma needs to have a word with you after the video or sometime. Yep. Um, uh, Worldwide Koji says again, I'd love to see Star Frontier's Monster Manual. The game really needed one. Tom. Yeah. 
So what's a little bit more about this real quick? Might as well go ahead and well, there's, throw the well, there's a, there's a lot, like I said, there's over 400 and then there's more listings every time we publish a new issue of the star frontiersman. So then you got to update the, the thing. And so I, I actually, to try to get it down to be not such a big mountain to climb, I said, all right, let's do this as three volumes. Let's just do the original <coughs> setting that was in Alpha Dawn, all those planets and all the creatures from those planets, all as one monster manual. And then let's do volume two would be anything that was in Zebulon's Guide, um, you know, um, you know, that, that sort of thing. And then the, um, and then I think the third volume was like anything fan created any, you know, cause there's some out there, um, yeah. you know, that there was one fan module that was published in issue 25 of the star frontiersman that had, they created 87 creatures for that world, which was overkill. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I was, I'm looking at this going, Wow, that's a lot of creativity. You didn't need that many, but they went they went crazy on it. Um, you know, mm -hmm. so that one world's got a lot of listings. So if you include that, so I wanted to do it by world. So you could just go in there and say, I'm running a, a, an adventure on, you know, Clarion. Mm -hmm. Just go to the chapter on Clarion. There's all the creatures, and do um, at the back of the creatures. Here's all the plants that were created for Clarion. So you've got this, it's like a field guide. You've got everything that was created for that planet, whether, you know, canon by the, you know, the original game designers, by the fans, everything's right there. You're, you know, if, if you're running a, an adventure on that planet, here's everything that's ever been created for that planet. See, and I like I, how you break that down. Because see, like with open worlds, I'm not doing it like that. What I'm doing with open worlds is, is, you know, one thing I did not like about D and D monster manuals was a lot of the monsters in there, you know, were unusable because they were so powerful, you know, liches and dragons and such. So with open worlds, what I'm doing is I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to put the, uh, um, I call it a critter catalog. The crit, the initial critter catalog is going to be broken up into two volumes. Volume one is going to be critters designed for player levels one to six no, one to seven, excuse me. And right. then the second volume is going to be critters designed for player character levels eight on up. Because that way, you know, you know, no nobody who starts off on a new RPG is going to sit them. I mean, they may want to buy both manuals, but why not give them the content that they can use in full immediately? But I'm also going to have a section in the back that's going to be designed. They're going to be, they're going to be called the overkills. And what the overkills are, it's going to be maybe about 10 or 15 monsters that are overkill in case you need like a really big baddie, you know, mm. and, and you don't want to buy the second. You need one. a dragon, which, yeah. you know, what you're describing is this. Honestly. Yeah. yeah, really. I mean, yeah, exactly. Same thing with Beck me when you take a look at Beck me and such, Yeah. you know, you start getting into it. So, yeah. but so, I mean, there's, there's been some debate, uh, you know, some people push back on, uh, you know, behind the scenes on, on that monster manual. And they, they were like, no, do it alphabetical. I don't know that, you know, you're not going to necessarily remember that there was a creature that began with the letter G. And, you know, I think, I really think. So how are you, how you going to lay them? It's, it's kind of fascinating to me because we never actually talked about, I, I, this is first I'm hearing it, everybody. Um, but, so you're not going to lay your manuals out alphabetically for monster manuals. What are what are the way you're going to lay them out? Well, by planet. I, I was thinking by planet. Uh, Good idea. We, I, I had a, enough people push back that I says, all right, just to keep everybody happy. I says, I, I redid all of the uh, spreadsheet into alphabetical. Mm -hmm. But I still have my non-alphabetical spreadsheet. <laughs> and I really feel like that's got to be the way to go because that just makes yeah, it yeah. easier for a game master to just say, we're adventuring on this planet. I need to know what's here. I don't want to go looking for it. I don't want to flip through a alphabetical listing See, of a whole book. You know, that, that's kind of a cool idea. Even you could actually apply that to like a, like a standard fantasy RPG because you could go like, you know, like you could have like an undead manual you could have a um manual of you know forest creatures cave dwellers 
you know, type thing. You'll know, see seafaring creatures, that type of thing. You You're could. giving me ideas, actually. I'm actually, I'm kind of going, wait a minute here. How can you I go? You could, but I, I just, um, you know, I think when you're dungeon crawling, you're going to have some undead. You're going to have some humanoids, some, you know. You yeah, might- but see, that's the whole point about marketing. Also, I mean, in all fairness, I'm, I'm a publisher. I'm like, come on, let's be honest. I mean, why do you think, why, and, and this is a thing that annoys me about Wizards of the Coast, that, that I'd love to be able to get a little bit into. What really bothers me about WotC is how they're doing their books now. Like as an example, how many players handbooks do they have for 5e? How many dungeon masters guides? How many monster manuals do they have? I mean, holy smokes. Yeah. You know? And that it's just started, like that started in 4.0. Yeah. Um, Cuz I remember I was so disenchanted with 3.5, 4.0. I says, "Let's try this. I this has got to be better somehow." I just assumed it was going to be better. And so I was like, so, I, you know, I bought the player's handbook the, and the Dungeon Master's Guide. And, you know, I go on the store, oh, Dungeon Master's Guide 2. And I'm thinking, oh, wow, Dungeon Master's Guide 2. This is great. Bought it right away. So I'm spending money. And, mm-hmm. and then I'm like, ah, wow, wow, wow. you know, and, and then nobody wanted to play 4.0. And everybody was like, ah. and, and next thing you know, they're working on fifth edition. And, and then I was like, that's it screw this. I'm going back to BX. Yep. You know, and RPG grandma says, I like by planet. She wants it by planet, which is two indexes, one for the planet, one for just alphabetical order. Yeah. I you mean, put in, in, you can put indexes in there that, mm-hmm. you know, lets you find anything. I mean, it, I think, uh, I think an index actually is pretty essential because let's face it, you're on the fly, you're rushing and everything, you know, yeah, sure, you may have a clarion manual, but you need to, if you need to find, you know, a specific type of creature and you know what that creature is called, boom, go to the index, grab it, go to the page number, you're done. Um, well, also, I think th- that doing it by planet has the effect of, uh, you're going through there and you, and you notice that this planet only has one creature created for it. Oh. Yeah. Now that's a blank canvas. So if you're looking for the blank canvas, yeah. you go, you know what, I'm going to create, four or five creatures for that planet. I'm going to run an adventure there. And, you know, then I'll go see that guy, Tom, with the Star Frontiersman and say, hey, uh, and I'll be like, yeah, that's a great article. You just, you know, expanded this ecosystem on this planet. I'm happy to publish it. But real quick, before I read Worldwide Goji's comment, mentioning about expanding, what I plan on doing is is we're, we're going to have a open worlds RPG um, website. And when you go to it, there's going to be the ability for players to go ahead and enter their custom made creature. And it's not going to be used by wizard tower to sell. It's going to go into a database that's online that people can go to for free and take a look at fan made content. And we will never take that content and put it in a book and sell it, you know, for profit or whatnot. But um, well, you, know, you, you trigger a memory, um, and, and RPG Grandma re- will remember this. If you go to the uh, StarFrontiersmen.us uh, forums, uh, which mm-hmm. still exist, you can go to the you can click on the tab for characters where people could, you know, yeah, type in their their character sheet uh, for their character, and. Um, you know, that was seemed to be very popular on that site. I actually used it to go, all right, uh, 15% of all the characters in here are Versk. So therefore, Versk are the least popular. You know, and then it'd be humans and Yuzarians are the most popular. The, you know, mm-hmm. so I just used it to reference for statistics. But it was very, very popular um, just being able to enter their character sheet. And, yep. and I actually used that feature had people put their character sheets on there. So the character sheet was online and uh, for running an online game, it was kind of handy that way. Yeah. Worldwide Gojikai says I had a friend of mine who does mech art freelance for Battletech and are trying to make playable back me conversions for Rangers and Sorcerer wild mage classes. We don't run races class. Um, Theta says I'm doing my M&Ms, my monster manuals by type alphabetically then making a random table based on environment location, but it's also fantasy, not sci-fi based on planet. I think that's a good idea, Tom. 
Yeah. Um, Gunther says, Gunther the man says, I'm a big fan of creatures laid up by biome, especially in large game settings. Yes. Yeah. That's actually, that's actually a really good idea. For, to me, it's handy. What's that? To me, it's just handy. And yeah. uh, when I was laying out my spreadsheets, I went through <laughs> like an article on trade goods. And so this article described this like bovine cow type of creature that's, you know, that, that's raised on this planet and it's slaughtered for the meat and for the hide. And, uh, you know, I included that in my list, even though it doesn't have a stat block because Star Frontiers, how easy is it to work up a stat block in Star Frontiers? It's, it's wicked yeah. easy. So, uh, you know, I just included everything I could find created by anybody mm -hmm. in, those, in those spreadsheets. Yeah, Guther even says, he says, even if it's a list at the back of the book stating where you're likely to find each creature, forest, grassland, taiga, caverns, etc. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I, I think, I think the thing is, is everybody, everybody has their optimal way, you know, um, you know, with me, you know, I have a system and it, it works for me, but, you know, and you've run into this, I'm sure with the frontiersmen, you know, you're getting feedback from your readers. So what the original star frontiersmen's ideas that you had for it, I'm sure morphed over time because you're kind of like, listening to people and kind of move changing a little bit and such. Um, yeah. David Flores I, I says, want to, I want to go back to something that uh, worldwide uh, Goji uh, said uh, mm -hmm. that um, he was working on those classes, like a conversion from Beck me to uh, battle tech. And uh, I have a document somewhere. I will look for it for you, dude, that uh, broke down the, the races class so, you know, and it broke down by experience points because the experience points totals were different for all of the, the BX classes. Uh -huh. And it broke down all the abilities and assigned a, an experience point value. So you could build a class. So if you want to build a halfling with thief abilities, you just build it. And, and, and it, 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 the document was Bingo. elegant. And I got it from somewhere, and I was like, I want to save that. That's pretty cool. You know, you could build a – with this, you could build a goblin uh, thief or a goblin wizard with this. So, you know, so it was it was a very a versatile document, and I came across it in the early 2000s. I'm, uh, I'm PM, share I, it with you. I will look for it and uh, send it to you worldwide. Yeah, because I'll because I actually have in open worlds, um, what I have is I have a thing called a called a class engine, and what it is is, you know, if you don't like the classes in the game, and you you want to create something, you can create a customized class for yourself, um, and if you follow the engine like you're supposed to, it'll always work with open worlds because it's designed to work with open worlds. Right. Um, David Flores says, I handy. plan to make a website. What's that? That's kind of handy. Yeah. David Flores says, I plan to make a website too. Shoot. I could probably help you make that. <laughs> huh? By the way, to everybody, I'm just going to say something about David Flor. Okay. Um, David has been working on Zonk. That guy has talent. You, you need something done. Talk to the man, pay the man money. He does excellent work. He's quick at it. And just good guy to work with. David Floor is a really good guy to work with. Yeah. Um, Thraxis says, I totally miss 4E. Played one game at a con. I was like, not today, Satan. It did handy, Satan. I can go play WoW and the computer will do the bookkeeping. This is what worries me about the new D&D &D on, on the VTT. You know, yeah, you know, the thing with the thing thing with VTT is, you know, I signed up for a, for a um, virtual tabletop. I don't use Watsies. I, I, I was really trying to get into it. We were actually me, you, and Eric were going to do a game. Yeah. But the thing is, holidays came, then I ended up getting sick. But, yeah. um, I think virtual tabletops are actually pretty cool. But with me, I I just think in those situations. Simple is best. What do you think? Uh, well, well, do you I, use them at all? 
I play online and we just do theater of the mind. And I was never in, I was into miniatures and tactical and, and the vinyl mat on the table and dry erase. And um, I got asked to sit in on a theater of the mind game online one time. And I went, and I remember thinking, and afterwards I was chewing on it a couple of days later going, this actually worked pretty good. Mm -hmm. And so then I started running some games and, um, you know, so I've, I've, I've way back, I don't know, 2009, 2008 time period, I might have played some um, on a VTT. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, at the time, I didn't, it didn't grab me. You know, yeah. now I play a little bit more online. So, well, Wavo, Roderick, welcome. Thanks for tuning in the show. You're an hour late. No big deal. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and you know what? I actually, um, you know, something interesting happened. And um, we're talking about AI, Roderick. Um, oh, yeah, we drifted. <laughs> yeah, but the thing is, no, no, we're fine. The thing is, what's really interesting is, and, and Roderick could probably chime in here with this, is, you know, I actually posted some imagery. And, you know, this is the danger of AI interpretation. We me and Tom Roderick were talking about this earlier. We kind of got into it and everything that some issues that me and David floor had today is, you know, Roderick thought it was AI that I was using. And, you know, he was like, Hey Don, you know, you're using AI, but you say you don't use it. I was like, no, here. And I showed kind of like the developmental pictures of it. You know, that's why it's always good to have your dev files. So if there is a major issue or something like that, you can show it, you yeah. know, you can say, Hey, here is my roughs and such. But, the, other, um, the other problem with with everybody kind of scrutinizing AI is they're like, yeah, I use an AI detector. Well, not all AI detectors are created equal, and they spit out a percentage. They say 67% well, AI. That's what happened. That's what happened when you put it, when you put my drawing. I think it was, it was either my elf or my fighter. I think it was my elf. But um, when you put that in the AI detector, it was like, 90% chance this is AI. So, you know, it, and, and there's the danger of this. Cause I think what's happening is places like Kickstarter and also places like um, a backer kit use these AI detectors and yeah. the technology is just so new. It's, it's well, really, really. I took a picture to of my cat and ran the cat and ran the photograph through AI and it came out 80 something percent. <laughs> AI, I told the cat that and you should have seen her reaction. She was not, you know, typical cat reaction. But, um, you know, it, it's when it when you when these AI detectors spit out a percentage, somebody then has to make a judgment and go. Um, so it's not sure. It's saying, you know, what percentage are you going to go with? Are you going to does it have to be over 80? Does it have to be over 60? Can it be 51 for you to say, nope. You're AI. We're not allowing you, um, you know, we're kicking you to the curb because that's it came out 51 percent. So it's got to be AI. So you have to make a judgment call. And if the guy's saying it's not AI, I just happen to use Photoshop, which is the same. Photoshop is computer tools used by a human mind. It's the same tools used by AI to make artwork. But see, in defense of backer kit. And in defense of places like um, uh, Kickstarter, I think the reason why they're also so strict about it is there's the liability factor. You know, they don't want to fund a half a million dollar Kickstarter, mm. you know, and then all of a sudden it turns out the person who did the fund, you know, the, 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 the campaign was using a lot of people's, artwork you know in ai because then you got a point if, if the court has a precedent where the you know the court set a precedent where these companies are liable now can you imagine the money because i mean I, it used to be if if a, oh, if a kickstarter hit 100 like, grand you were like wow now kickstarters are hitting what is what did luke guy luke guy just ran one that what six hundred thousand dollars wasn't it well, I didn't pay it. I didn't. I didn't follow it because he was going to give me an interview, and then it never. It fell through. So I was like, "Screw you! I'm not. I'm not going <laughs> to. I'm not going to watch your no, kick." 
starters. But no, it, it was like it was like a it, he had like a twenty thousand dollar goal or something like that, or, or fifty thousand yeah. or something. It was crazy money. Yeah, and that's yeah. actually getting to be more and more the norm. All the all the million dollar kickstarters that yep, went for off. free animals. Yeah. Um, yes, agreed. Um, yeah, and, you, and RPG Grandma is really really creative. Um, she cool. has, yeah. She has been. She a, knows. She knows her stuff too about. She's it. collaborated with me for years on Star Frontiers uh, fanzines and on the the forums and um, just uh, you know I consider her a friend, you know that I've never met, but mm -hmm. great collaborator. I've enjoyed her material. She's really good. Yep. Yeah, she's she is she is. Well, she's right here, so yeah. you can't badmouth her. Yeah. <laughs> RPG grandma. No, seriously though, you you are you are one of the and I'm not I'm not kissing ass here. I'm just gonna make a statement. You're one of the pillars of my little gaming world online because you are always willing to help, ultra friendly, ultra helpful. Um, need more people like you out there. And 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 you know, I kind of dump on 4E a little bit, but you know what? There were some things in the um, 4E Dungeon Master's Guide that I really liked where you, you know, you could take uh, the templates, you know, yeah. like, and, and add a vampire template to an ogre. Yeah. Now it's a new creature. I kind of mm -hmm. liked that. I really did kind of like that. And then I think there was Adventure Companions. So it was like a, it was a, NPC basically it could be a wolf, could be a halfling with a bow, mm -hmm. and um, you know that you know. So it was like Chewbacca with Han Solo basically, and so it was an NPC the DM created, but the player could run it, and it was yeah. just usually written out on a index card. And I really yeah. liked that rule system as well as the um, the minions rule, mm -hmm. one hit point minions. Yeah. I love that too. That was yeah. great. And Thraxis says, completely agree. I love the Albert Rodeo Watsis VTT is what I'm worried about. It's going to venture into video game territory. You know what? Albert Rodeo is nice. Yeah. Um, Wibbler goes, man, as a publisher, AI has made it frustrating, not only navigating the minefield of artists pretending AI is theirs, but accusations that real art is AI. It feels like a lose-lose. Early on, I, I, I posted AI as original. Because I was dealing with a guy online, dealing with him for, I think it was like, it was, it was a while, six, eight months. And he was providing me artwork. I'm paying for original artwork. And I was on Twitter. And I went ahead and said, oh, here's our new yada, yada, yada. And I was making also running my mouth about how I'm anti-AI. And I think it was Kim Winston that went ahead and said, called me out. And I think, I think early on it was um, Floor that helped him said, you're using AI, dude. That's AI. And I was like, I got indignant. I was like, no, it's not. You know, I know the artist. You know what I mean? I'm, you know, yada, yada, yada. Guy. <laughs> yeah. And hey, then uh, <laughs> I, I, I think, I think, I think it was Eric Tenkar or you, it was you or Eric said, why don't you go ahead and ask the guy to see his roughs, his rough drafts. And I asked the guy and he blocked me. <laughs> it was like, Hey, can I, well, I, I don't have him anymore. I'm like, well, Every artist keeps their rough block. Well, uh, there's that well, <laughs> busted. That, that told you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, but, but real quick, Roderick has a really good point here. It is frustrating because you want to be a good steward of, of what you're doing. You want to put out good product and it is so dangerous out there. Because then you get accused of putting out AI and you didn't. And, and the thing is, is, you know, when you're, a, when, when you're out there and you're trying to dev games and everything, the last thing you want to have to do is start answering, you know, whack-a-mole with playing whack-a-mole with people and having to show people your roughs constantly because you're always being called out on. It's kind of a, it's kind well, of a pain in the ass. I suggested to you earlier today and, and uh, address this to uh, Roderick that uh, it's to the point where I, I think you can't, you're not going to be able to just slap a no AI art or writing logo on the cover that you're going to have to on that page where you're putting the mm -hmm. copyright yeah. and all your publisher information, you're going to have to hand write out 
uh, a declaration that you didn't use it and then sign it, um, you know, number one. And then at the very back of the book, include a page where you put the roughs or a half done, you know, so when you're contracting for artwork, you're going to pay the guy what he's asking for his finished work. But then you're also going to put in the contract, I, I need, I need a rough or, you know, I need a, so that I can put something in the back so that when somebody picks it up and says, no, nah, I don't believe you, you're lying, dude. Right there, that last page has got well, those, you know, just check a, that, it. That's actually a really good idea, but you could do it a little bit different way and it's a lot less of a pain in the ass and it's easily updatable. What you do is, and, and I think I'm going to do it. That's a great idea, is on the Open Worlds role-playing game website, you can, you can use it almost like a marketing tool, a point of interest to draw people and say, you know, here is, you know, a, 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 you know, click on this to go ahead and see how our process works. And then you have like, this is how we do some of our art and you have select art with the phases of what, what you have. Sort of like what I did with Roderick is, you know, I showed Roderick, you know, my raw pencil, my you know, rough, rough sketch a little bit better. And I was like three or four imagery that showed kind of like the, the thing as it goes. And I want to read something real quick. Cause this tells you about this guy's character. Okay. Roderick has character. Um, Roderick says, I'll totally own up to that accusation because Don, as Don says, it all came back as AI. I've learned to just adjust my mind, um, my own business now. You know what? No, I, I'm going to say something. I, I am glad he called me. And the reason why I'm glad about it, not because I had a gotcha moment or anything like that, but I think what, what as a publisher, I should be able to be called out. And sometimes I should have to explain myself. I owe it to the people who entrust me by buying my games. And it, it, you know, it's, I've always, it's like my dad used to say, you know, don't be afraid of the truth. You know, it's 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 people who lie that are afraid to, to answer questions because, you know, they don't want, you know, to to screw up. And, you know, also, though, what that allowed me to do is this is, you know, I'm sure he, Roderick was on the fence with about me, you know, like, oh, here's this guy, you know, he's using AI art. Got it clarified. We're friends on Facebook. We talk, you know, can't wait to meet him at a, uh, at a game con sooner or later. We're going to, we're going to bump into each other and I'll buy him a beer. If he drinks beer, I'll buy him an see if he doesn't, you know? So I think, I think that asking questions is a good thing. Um, Roderick also says for giggles, I put in my own writing and it came up 5% AI, one detector and 60% another again. Yeah. No consistency. And then also he says, uh, here's food for thought. If you're a a published writer, meaning your stuff is out there and AI is using your stuff in its algorithm. When you feed your own stuff in the detector, it comes back as AI. Oh, yeah. Hadn't thought of that. And then go through the mad says Elmore's works referenced by a lot of AI, given the massive false positive wonder what would happen if we ran his art through a detector, probably mm -hmm. it would come back as, you know, depending. And, and also you want to do an interesting thing. Tomorrow morning, take an image, run it through an AI detector. In the afternoon, run that same image through that same AI detector. You'll see drastic differences in its percentages. Huh? I've, I've tried that. Well, I've run um, hand-drawn drawings through an AI detector, and it's like 40% AI. <laughs> yep. Um, Worldwide Goji says, uh, famous gaming quote in history, you know the Star Frontiers game is nice, but you know what the kids will really go crazy over? Buck Rogers, Lorraine, somebody at TSR. <laughs> oh, Lorraine, Lorraine. No. Um, Tom She's still alive. You, he gets home to hammer tell. us from me. Lame as they are. Oh, I bet you you're talented. I bet you. I, I've, I'd love to see some of your uh, drawings, RPG Grandma. Um, you guys can just call me Rod. No problem. Yeah, Rod. We will call you that, Rod. Um, David Flores says, I just tried running an image through an AI detector and the detector crashed. Is, is that bad? <laughs> David, you know what? I'm going to be honest with you, buddy. If I ever meet you, I'm not letting you drive, <laughs> you know, but Hey everybody, I, I'm also going to say something here is, um, we've been on here an hour and a half. We like to keep it about an hour. I know everybody's been talking and everything, but I think Tom has to get up early tomorrow morning. Correct. 
yeah. um, and do his thing and go to work. And um, I have an early morning doctor's appointment myself that I got to go to. My last week of two jobs. I'm so excited. Congratulations. And so, in the middle of that, we're getting a blizzard. So, eh. ah, gotcha. Joy. Well, I'll tell you what, everybody, thank you very much for tuning in to tonight's video. Tom, thank you. Thanks um, for I hope we me. do this again soon. Yep. And uh, again, everybody, Rod, RPG Grandma, Worldwide, um, Goji Kai, um, Go Through the Mat, everybody, thank you very much tonight. Um, this is probably one of the most engaging lives that I have had. Um, I appreciate it. Um, we're going to be back online or with another live next Tuesday. If anybody wants to give ideas on what you want to hear talked about, discussed, you can go ahead and drop me an email at info at wizardtowergames.com. Again, info at wizardtowergames.com. If anybody here has not subscribed to my channel, if you would hit that like and subscribe, it would help me out. I'm trying to build my channel up. And also, Head over to Tom over at Tabletop Tap Room and hit that like and subscribe on his channel also. Thank you. Um, Tom covers a lot of really cool stuff. Um, he has a court reporter series he's running right now, keeping track, tight rein on an individual. Um, lots of content. I'm sure he's going to have lots of content in the future on that. But also, again, thank you very much, everybody. I hope everybody had a really nice Easter if you celebrated it. Um, I'm going to be back online, up and running, um, as you all can see. Um, I should be cleared. I'm supposed to get cleared officially on Friday because I get my port taken out tomorrow. So, good deal. So, everybody, thank you again for tuning in. Hope everybody has a good night. Tom? Don? And uh, this is Don from Wizard Tower Games and Tom from Tabletop Tap Room. Yep. We'll talk to everybody later. Have a good night, everybody. Good night.